going to go ahead and get started there, okay? All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, so it's uh, my pleasure today to introduce a, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Brian Graham. Uh, Brian uh, did his uh, undergraduate and master's training at MIT and then moved uh, across the city, barely, to uh, Harvard where he got his uh, MD. He then proceeded to do his residency, residency and then fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine here in our division uh, at Colorado, joining the faculty uh, after that in 2010. He's now an associate uh, professor and has a, a well-funded and uh, very nicely established research program uh, in uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, in which he uses models, uh, a model of pulmonary hypertension predicated on uh, schistosomiasis, which is a, an incredibly important problem um, in the developing world particularly. Um, from a pathways perspective, his main focus has been studying the, the immunology of, uh, of this model of pulmonary hypertension uh, with an emphasis on the TGF-beta signaling pathway in that model. So, and with that, I will turn it over to Brian. Thank you very much, Steve. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, uh, thanks very much for uh, having a uh, pulmonary a clinician come and speak to you today. Um, hopefully it'll be somewhat enlightening. I understand this is somewhat of a diverse audience, so I've prepared some initial slides you'll see that talk a little bit more about what pulmonary hypertension is clinically for those clinicians in the room that may or may not actually remember that from their medical school days and then move on to some more of the basic science in the latter half of the talk. So, um, so I'm going to be speaking today about the role of inflammation in pulmonary hypertension, as Steve mentioned. Um, I'd like to start off with my acknowledgments. This is a picture of my lab. Um, let's see if I can get this thing to work. This is uh, Linda Sanders here, and Claudia McCall, uh, Raul Kumar, Baruch Casa. And uh, so I work under the umbrella of the Ruben Tudor Lab. Um, he's a pathologist by training. Uh, and um, these are uh, other members of the Ruben uh, Lab. And then also um, affiliate closely with Kurt Stenmark and the CVP. Other members at, um, here and abroad uh, as well. And my funding is shown. So I'm going to uh, just briefly uh, kind of go through what's pulmonary hypertension for those who are familiar with that, talk about the role of inflammation in pulmonary hypertension specifically, and then move on to our research in schistosomiasis. So uh, this is probably a, a bad flashback for the clinicians in the room here to uh, first year medical school. But this is a picture of the circulatory system. So the uh, right ventricle here pushes the blood out into the pulmonary artery, and then it enters the pulmonary circular, uh, circulatory bed, and then it returns by the veins to the left ventricle. And so pulmonary hypertension is mathematically defined as an increase in the mean pulmonary artery pressure in the pulmonary artery to excess of 25 millimeters of mercury. Um, and so we think of this as like an electrical circuit analogy, where the pressure is the voltage, current is cardiac output, and the resistance is the pulmonary vascular resistance. So mathematically then, the increase in pulmonary artery pressure can result from an increase in cardiac output, an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, or an increase in left atrial pressure or the pulmonary venous side of things. Uh, it's rare that cardiac output alone uh, causes an, an increase in the pressure for reasons that I won't get into. So uh, we, uh, from, from a clinical perspective then, we <clears throat> roughly divide pulmonary hypertension into two categories. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is defined as an increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance here on the arterial side, versus pulmonary venous hypertension, an increase in the resistance over here. The distinction is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is determined at the time of right heart catheterization as to whether or not the pressure is elevated on the pulmonary venous side or not. Uh, this is the uh, current uh, clinical classification system for pulmonary arterial hypertension. I just show this because there's a lot of different things on here. I will be coming back later in my talk, as Steve mentioned, to a, a common problem worldwide, just a somiasis, a parasitic infection that can cause pulmonary hypertension. There are many other causes, however, and uh, for those that are oncologists in the room, you can get it with um, chronic hemolytic anemia, myeloproliferative disorders. Splenectomy is associated with it, but it's not clear exactly if it's more of a risk factor or an independent uh, 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 etiology. Um, I will just mention, I don't know if uh, any of you um, saw this paper that came out about a month ago, maybe even a little less, uh, in Science Translational Medicine. So actually there's some association with lung cancer and pulmonary hypertension. So these are patients with pulmonary arterial, or I'm sorry, with lung cancer, who then were evaluated for pulmonary hypertension. Um, there are some caveats to this study. This is out of a group, oops, this is out of a group in Gießen, Germany. Um, the, uh, the clinical characteristics here were uh, echocardiogram, uh, identified pulmonary artery systolic pressure, so that's a rough estimate. It's not a true measurement. Um, the uh, upper limit of normal that they took was between 33 and 34 millimeters of mercury, which is a little bit lower than typical. Often we go up to 35 or even 40. 
And so when you use a higher threshold, the number of individuals drops down dramatically. There were some elevated um, pressures, though, here. Um, they looked at uh, vascular wall thickening, particularly in the area of lung cancers, and saw that there was an increase in the vicinity of the tumors as opposed to the non-tumor-associated areas with both adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, in this paper, they subsequently went on to do a mouse, so actually three different mouse models, uh, a, a RAF mutation, a KRAS mutation, and a tail vein injection of lung Lewis uh, carcinoma. Uh, the uh, representative image they show was this one. Honestly, I'm not too surprised that they had a mild increase in the right ventricular systolic pressure with a, a lung that packed full of tumor. Um, but they did show that there was some increase in inflammation in some hyperproliferative pulmonary vascular cells. So something you could look into if you're uh, interested in this. Um, I'll just briefly show you sort of normal uh, human histopathology of the pulmonary vasculature, if you haven't seen it previously. So uh, this is what a normal pulmonary artery looks like. This is a, a large elastic artery. You can tell because of the elastic layer here. Uh, smaller pulmonary artery. This is a, a sort of a precapillary vessel. There's a little bit of a muscular layer here. This is a transition from a precapillary vessel with a muscular layer into a non-muscularized capillary or precapillary vessel. And then this is a non-muscularized precapillary vessel going into capillaries here. That's normal pulmonary vascular histopathology. In pulmonary hypertension, you get these uh, interesting lesions. So this is an intimal lesion called an eccentric intimal lesion, concentric intimal lesion with uh, onion skin type uh, pathology. You get uh, thickening. Uh, this is, uh, again, sort of concentric intimal uh, lesion. You get this really remarkable um, uh, lesion, which is uh, really kind of uh, pathognomonic for pulmonary arterial hypertension called a plexiform lesion, which is a little twisted up ball of endothelial cells. Interestingly, if you... Um, take that out and uh, analyze the uh, clonality of that lesion. It turns out that often they're all clonally derived from a single endothelial cell progenitor, which is uh, somewhat of a tie-in to uh, the cancer hypothesis and pulmonary hypertension I'll, I'll touch upon in a, in a minute or two. Uh, and then you get other lesions of endothelial nature. These are dilated angiomatoid type lesions, et cetera. Uh, we also see thickening of the uh, pulmonary muscle layer. This is a small vessel that shouldn't have a muscle layer that required one. And then you can get thickening of the adventitia as well, uh, inflammatory cell infiltrates. And I'll talk about that as well in a few slides. <clears throat> so um, the clinical presentation, again, for the few clinicians in the room, is patients present with uh, right heart failure signs and symptoms. So uh, the symptoms would include shortness of breath, swelling of the legs, uh, ascites, uh, 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 lightheadedness spells, particularly with exertion, and then they may actually go on to faint. And uh, on examination, they may have an elevated jugular venous pressure reflective of the right heart failure. Uh, peripheral edema, again, allowed P2, second heart sound, and a heave of the right ventricle. The right ventricle is dilated and having dysfunction. Um, there are treatments available. They target three pathways in particular, the nitric oxide, endothelium receptor, and prostacyclin analog pathways. These primarily function as vasodilators, um, which unfortunately don't really target the underlying pathology that I'll mention again further in a minute. Um, but these are the um, primary pathways. There are FDA-approved medications uh, that, uh, that are effective in this treatment. So uh, overall, the major issues with pulmonary arterial hypertension at this time is that the diagnosis is generally delayed. It's a median of about two years since onset of symptoms to the time patients are diagnosed because the symptoms are kind of nonspecific. You have to do somewhat invasive testing. You can get an echocardiogram initially. You have to go on to do a right heart catheterization that would actually formally make the diagnosis. Um, it remains, unfortunately, fatal. So without any treatment at all, it's a median survival of about two and a half years. Currently, the medical therapies allow prolonged survival out to a seven to nine year time frame on average. Uh, and unfortunately, as I mentioned, that oh, you can't go into lung transplant. The targets don't actually uh, treat the problem. So we mostly have vasodilators, but the problem is unfortunately more complex than that. And so in talking about the problem, I'm um, talking a little bit now about the cancer hypothesis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So I'm going to pull out this um, figure, which I'm sure you've all seen, uh, the Hanahan Weinberg Cell 2000 paper that shows the hallmarks of cancer. And uh, I have indicated on here the, uh, the one that doesn't really apply, oops, uh, which is uh, we don't see active... Uh, invasion or metastases. Uh, we do, however, have uh, uh, sustained proliferative signaling. An example that Steve mentioned is TGF beta signaling, which I'll talk about further in a little bit. Um, there's a apoptosis resistance of the vascular smooth muscle and endothelial cells. And then there's uh, some enabling of replicative immortality. For example, there's uh, uh, telomerase um, mutations associated with this condition that assist in the, uh, the ongoing proliferation of the cells. Uh, and then you've uh, no, doubt, no doubt seen the updated version, which includes four more things. And on here, there is, uh, uh, furthermore, a uh, shift of um, cellular radiogenics. Similar to cancer, we see an aerobic glycolysis phenomenon, particularly in the pulmonary artery smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells. Uh, we see genomic instability with a loss of heterozygosity, particularly one of the genes associated with familial pulmonary arterial hypertension, the BMPR2, or um, morphogenic protein receptor 2. Uh, 
Uh, and um, there's uh, tumor promoting inflammation. And so that's going to be the focus of the rest of my talk. So, uh, so what's the evidence that inflammation can cause pulmonary arterial hypertension? So the first one is that, the, as I showed briefly previously, the, there are many etiologies that are associated with pulmonary hypertension that are associated with inflammation. Uh, these include uh, disease triggers, such as autoimmune disease. Scleroderma is the most common one that we see, as well as infection. There's two particular forms of infection, HIV and schistosomiasis. Uh, schistosomiasis I'll talk about again, uh, further in a few slides. This is a case presentation we published a few years ago. This is a 31-year-old lady that grew up in an area uh, endemic with schistosomiasis in a rural part of Brazil in the uh, northeast corner of Brazil. Uh, she presented with fainting spells, had a chest X-ray that was notable for an extremely large heart, uh, and on heart catheterization had a pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 120 millimeters of mercury. She was subsequently treated with some oral therapy that was available in Brazil at the time and then ultimately died. Um, we, uh, in collaboration with uh, some people in Brazil, received some of her autopsy tissue and was notable for the, um, the pathologic lesions that I showed previously, including, again, that plexiform lesion, that clonal proliferation of endothelial cells, uh, a hallmark of group one or uh, WHO group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, so uh, another um, uh, evidence or other evidence that <clears throat> uh, inflammation is uh, potentially has a role in pulmonary arterial hypertension is the histopathology, which can show uh, evidence of uh, inflammatory regions around the vessels um, <clears throat> in the interstitium as well as around the vessels here in patients who, uh, these are explanted lung tissues for patients that have lung transplants uh, for their pulmonary arterial hypertension. And in a paper in 2012, we showed that indeed there's a loose correlation, but statistically significant correlation between the degree of inflammation and the uh, vascular remodeling, uh, showing that there is correlation there with uh, the, the clinical disease. Um, on further more detailed histopathology, you can see evidence of uh, particular immune cell types. This includes a, a large variety, including macrophages, monocytes, et cetera, et cetera. And these are some representative images from a publication that showed this. Uh, there's other publications that have shown other discrete cell types. There's also a, a, a paper coming out pretty soon that's going to do flow cytometry on, on uh, lung tissue and show also that you can see immune cell populations by flow cytometry. Um, another, uh, another form of evidence that uh, you can get inflammation or inflammation can contribute to pulmonary arterial hypertension is that um, animals that are exposed to these uh, pathologic stimuli that can trigger inflammation uh, can cause pulmonary hypertension experimentally. So this is an example of, uh, of uh, non-human uh, primates, macaques, that are infected with an HIV-like virus. And so they performed heart, this group in Pittsburgh performed heart catheterizations on these monkeys uh, before and after infection and showed that they developed pulmonary hypertension. And indeed, there's uh, uh, significant pulmonary vascular remodeling and these uh, perivascular infiltrates, again, reminiscent of the human histopathology. Uh, another example is our own work. This is our mice that are uh, exposed to schistosomiasis, a parasitic infection that's uh, present uh, uh, in developing countries. And so when we expose mice to um, the schistosomiasis eggs and then challenge them, they can go on to develop pulmonary arterial hypertension on heart catheterization. We see an increase in the right ventricular systolic pressure. And on quantification, we see an increase of the thickness of the medial layer, the smooth muscle cell layer of the, of the pulmonary vessels. Uh, and they also can get a little bit of right ventricular hypertrophy as well. Um, so despite all that evidence that inflammation has a potentially uh, important role in pulmonary arterial hypertension, the data that, uh, that uh, you can actually treat the inflammation and make the pulmonary arterial hypertension better are lacking. And particularly, there's only really kind of one case series that showed this to any reasonable degree. This is a uh, publication out of Spain in 2008 in patients that have very particular form of extremely inflammatory cause of pulmonary arterial hypertension, that due to lupus. And they had a very small number, eight patients oops, that responded, eight patients that did not respond. Uh, and they gave them uh, pretty hefty immunosuppressants, uh, intravenous cyclophosphamide at a reasonable dose. Uh, they did see in the patients that they uh, judged to be responders, they saw an improvement in the six-minute walk distance, that is, they could walk farther, and some improvement in the heart catheterization parameters. Uh, and subsequent case reports have gone on to confirm that this is probably a real phenomenon. But it's really only in this particular group of extraordinarily inflammatory uh, etiology of pulmonary hypertension. So um, as far as why inflammation, why inflammation has not really worked otherwise in pulmonary hypertension. So there's several potential uh, causes. So one is that the target is not really clear. There's probably pro-vascular uh, remodeling inflammation, which is bad. And so if you block that, you might get improvement. But there's probably also counter-regulatory mechanisms. So for example, you see those T cells, B cells, macrophages, et cetera. Some of them are probably good, some of them are probably bad. 
just kind of wiping them all out with cyclophosphamide may or may not actually give overall clinical benefit. Um, it could be too late. So it could be that inflammation is the cause of the initial trigger of uh, pulmonary hypertension, and then you go on to develop the vascular modeling, which runs somewhat autonomously later in the disease course. And so when you have a patient with advanced disease, blocking the inflammation may or may not be of benefit clinically later in the disease. And then I'll just mention it's possible it could be an epiphenomenon. That is, it's true, true, and unrelated. It could be that um, inflammation could be a consequence of vascular remodeling, not the other way around, or it could be that they're developing in parallel. Obviously, I don't think it's the latter category. I just mention it because I'm interested in schistosomiasis, pulmonary hypertension, personally. So, Okay, so with that, we'll go on to schistopulmonary hypertension. Uh, so schistosomiasis, a little bit of background for uh, those of you that have forgotten your parasitology from a long time ago. So this is a um, parasitic disease. It's a snail-borne um, uh, worm that's released in freshwater in tropical countries. Um, they're worldwide. There's about 200 million individuals that are infected with the condition. Um, there are three primary species, Mansoni, Japonicum, and Hematobium. Uh, Japonicum and Mansoni cause um, intestinal and hepatosplenic disease. Hematobium causes urinary schistosomiasis. Uh, in Africa, you get um, the Hematobium and the Mansoni. Uh, Japonicum is particularly present in Southeast Asia. And then Mansoni is particularly prevalent in um, Brazil. This uh, figure down in here shows that actually a long time ago, Puerto Rico was uh, involved with schistosomiasis. That was subsequently eradicated a few decades ago by good public health campaign work. Uh, it is one of the six neglected tropical diseases. It's the number two most common parasitic infection after malaria. Um, so the uh, overall state of things, if you're a, a public health advocate, is um, not so hot. So in uh, 2016, the last year that figures were available, as I mentioned, a little over 200 million individuals were infected. That is required treatment. Uh, unfortunately, only about 88 million individuals were actually treated. And so the overall prevalence of the condition worldwide has remained above 200 million for um, many years now. Uh, there are multiple reasons for problems with that. One of them is um, lack of funding for actual implementation. Uh, the um, uh, lack of capacity where the uh, regions are that the infection is actually occurring. These are um, often countries where the uh, political situation, environmental, uh, I'm sorry, uh, economic situation, et cetera, are, um, are not very good. Uh, and so they uh, have uh, more pressing priorities, et cetera. The infrastructure may not actually support testing and treating. Um, there, uh, you may not have coordinated treatment. And then the last one is zoonotic infection. So uh, water buffalo, uh, mice, um, other animals can become infected with schistosomiasis and propagate the life cycle in the um, environment. And so if you have a you know, limited number of uh, doses of prosequanil, the common anti-helminthic, you obviously prioritize treating people rather than a water buffalo, which would require a lot of doses of the, of the same drug. So uh, this is the life cycle of the parasitic infection. It's a mandatory two-host life cycle. So uh, the two hosts are people or mammals. and um, and snails, and so the, uh, in brief, you get the snails that relief, release uh, cercaria, which is a free swimming um, worm in the fresh water. That then penetrates through the skin of individuals that are uh, playing in the water, working in the water, or drinking the water, et cetera. It takes about five minutes or so to penetrate through the skin. Uh, there's enzymatic reactions involved, et cetera. The, um, upon penetration, they lose their tail and uh, pass into the next life cycle, the schistosomulae. They then pass into the uh, circulatory system, the systemic venous circulation, where they then migrate up into the lungs. You get an initial um, hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, it's called Kadayama fever. Uh, you get uh, fevers, eosinophilia, cough, et cetera, chest x-ray infiltrates. That subsequently spontaneously resolves after about eight weeks as the parasite passes through the lungs and enters, uh, in the case of Mansoni and Japonicum, the um, portal venous system. For hematobium, it goes around the urinary plexus. And uh, there the worms uh, mate, start to release eggs. They release uh, several hundred eggs per day, the vast majority of which erode through the wall of the colonic mucosa, enter the feces, and then return to the environment, and then complete the life cycle by reinfecting the snail. A minority of the eggs are retained within the host uh, in the portal venous system. They float downstream into the liver and can cause a preportal liver fibrosis. So you get a fibrotic reaction there, but you don't actually develop cirrhosis. That is, you don't really enter liver failure. Patients can then develop portal hypertension, high blood pressure in the portal venous system. And unfortunately, a common cause of death is exsanguination from uh, portal venous um, or esophageal varices rupturing and then exsanguination. Uh, so that's the life cycle. So the epidemiology from the pulmonary hypertension perspective. So again, you've got about 200 million infected with 
Mansoni, about 20% go on to develop this very severe form of liver prefrontal fibrosis called hepatosplenic disease. That gives you about 40 million uh, with this hepatosplenic disease, and then subsequently about 15% or so are going to develop pulmonary arterial hypertension. That leaves you with about 6 million individuals with pulmonary arterial hypertension, making it one of the major, if not the number one, cause of uh, PAH worldwide. So uh, just give you a little bit of background about the immunology of the parasite. So um, the, uh, when the uh, eggs get into the uh, portal venous system, uh, so you initially the, uh, the worms and, the, uh, and whatnot are there, and they're causing a localized immune response uh, directed against the worm itself. Uh, this causes a Th1 type response um, to worm-derived antigens. And then once the worms start to uh, mate and release eggs, these eggs are enzymatically active, they're live, and so they're releasing a ton of, um, of uh, factors. You get uh, then a switch from a Th1 to a Th2 type immune response. You get a lot of eosinophils, fibrocytes, et cetera. Uh, you get a lot of cytokines, including IL-4, 5, 10, and 13. Uh, the immunology is a little bit tricky to develop a prolonged um, uh, uh, immunity to. So the individuals that are infected are at risk for becoming recurrently infected. Um, uh, there are many reasons for this. One is a partial immune suppression. Uh, caused by interleukin-10. The other is that the worm is actually very effective at evading the host immune system by the coat of the worm, the tegment, uh, and that uh, the eosinophils and macrophages cannot effectively clear the parasite. And so uh, you can sometimes see individuals that have uh, been infected for decades at a time from the same few worm pairs uh, causing ongoing infection. Uh, so as I showed, this is the life cycle in nature. The uh, life cycle can be reproduced in the laboratory. We have the capability of doing this here, but we don't actually do it. We get uh, parasites sent to us from the Biomedical Research Institute, uh, a NIAID contracted facility in Rockville, Maryland. They originally derived their parasite from a group of school children from Puerto Rico that came to the U.S. in the 1950s. They went to D.C. and for like a tour group, and uh, uh, they were found to have schistosomiasis. It, uh, the parasite was then cultured at the Naval Medical Research Institute, so it's the NMRI strain, and that uh, was then acquired by this group that maintains the parasite for us. So in brief, what you do in the lab is you uh, start off with your snails. Oops. Start off with your snails. You uh, expose the uh, snails to the parasite, the myricidia. Uh, the snails, about uh, a month later, start to release the parasite called cercaria uh, in the fresh water. You then take the uh, parasite and you put it into a vial and you dip the mouse tail into the vial. It uh, waits about half an hour to get pretty good uptake of the parasite. Uh, you can adjust the dose of the uh, parasitic infection by how many cercaria you're putting in the water. Uh, the mice then go on to develop the... Um, the, uh, uh, the um, productive infection in the portal venous system, and they start laying eggs, uh, a lot of which then are retained within the liver. And so about six weeks later, you take the liver out, you grind it up in a blender, then you sieve it out to remove all the liver debris, and you end up with a relatively purified, non-sterile form. These are live eggs here. Uh, you do all this in, um, in saline so that the eggs don't hatch. The eggs hatch upon exposure to fresh water. That's, how they, that's the cue for them to move on to the next life cycle in, um, in nature. And so in the, in the lab, uh, basically what you do is you take these uh, purified ova, and if you want to work with it, then you keep the ova in saline, and if you want to go on to reinfect your snails, then you add them to fresh water and, and expose them to your snails. So we receive from the BRI um, uh, mice in this stage here that have been pre-infected, and so we wait a few weeks and then grind up the livers and then use the eggs in our model of pulmonary hypertension. So in brief, this is our mouse model that we work with. We uh, do a sensitization and challenge model. This was adapted from the immunology letter literature from decades ago where they were doing this to because you get nice granulomas, type 2 um, granulomas. So basically, you uh, intraperitoneally sensitize the mice. Um, with uh, We had worked out a dose of 240 eggs per gram body weight. Wait two weeks for the adaptive immune response to occur. Then you would challenge them with 175, 170 eggs per gram body weight. Wait seven days, and then you uh, do a heart catheterization. The mice have pulmonary hypertension at that point. Uh, the um, infection is not a um, like a chronic indwelling infection. They're not. Um, they don't have uh, live worms in them, so they're not uh, spontaneously uh, developing pH. And so they will go on to to clear the infection on their own after about two weeks. Uh, that is, the eggs will be wiped out by the immune system, and it sort of self resolves. <coughs> So uh, I showed you this data already. So we get this model of pulmonary hypertension where we get an increase in the right ventricular systolic pressure and an increase in the media uh, thickness of the vessels and a small degree of right ventricular hypertrophy as well. Uh, I will mention that um, we, we did this a while ago. We don't do it currently. But there's a group in the UK that was doing this more for a while uh, out of um, Cambridge, uh, Nick Morell's group. Uh, and they showed that you can actually do the circaria form infection, that is the tail dip into the vial. Uh, they actually used a 
a thing where they put the mice into a, a fish tank and had the mice kind of paddle around in the fish tank with a parasite penetrating through. It's harder to adjust the dose that way, though. Uh, and uh, they found that the right ventricular systolic pressure of the mice, that is evidence of pulmonary hypertension, correlated with whether or not the mice actually get uh, uh, prolonged infection or not. So if they have eggs in them, then they get a rise in the right ventricular systolic pressure. Some mice, though, are kind of naturally not great at, um, at maintaining the infection within them for reasons that are not entirely clear. And so if you average them all out, it uh, doesn't meet statistical significance. But if you kind of weed out the ones that didn't have uh, the sustained infection, then you can see some benefit. In the, um, in the mice that are um, uh, infected, when you give them prosequantil, the dose, the uh, anti-helminthic that's used in people, the pulmonary hypertension gets better. That does not occur in people. So in people, you can um, give them prosequantil, and it will uh, eradicate the infection. But it's thought that the ones who are presented at a relatively advanced stage are some, at point, some point of no return, and they can't actually have, um, they don't get uh, clinical benefit from treatment of prosequantil at that stage. Okay. So uh, this is our current working model of, of uh, um, the, what we think is going on in schistosomiasis pulmonary hypertension. So um, this is our, and I'm going to sort of transition now to talk more about the basic science stuff. So um, we uh, see that there's this initial presentation of the antigen by our eggs, uh, taken up by dendritic cells, we think, and then presented to uh, CD4 T cells, which then become a TH2 phenotype. They then start to express IL-4 and IL-13. This causes activation of macrophages to an M2 or alternatively activated phenotype. Uh, they then uh, release factors, which I'll go into in a few slides, that cause homing of Lys6C positive monocytes. These monocytes then uh, bring in a protein called thrombospondin 1, which has the ability to activate TGF beta. And the active TGF beta is then uh, necessary to cause um, vascular remodeling. And then you get thickening, and proliferation, et cetera, of the vascular cells, and then that causes them to actually get pulmonary hypertension. So that's our uh, current working model. So I'm going to proceed through a few of these steps and kind of show you the evidence that we've established over, over this. I'd say I've been working on kind of on this area for about 10 years now, sort of piecing together the various parts. So the first area I'm going to focus on is the type 2 or TH2 uh, CD4 tail <coughs> phenotype. Um, so, um, so one thing we see is we see an increase in IL-4 and IL-13 uh, at the level of RNA and at the level of protein and also by immunostaining in the whole lung lysates and in the lung tissue of these mice that are exposed to schistosomiasis, IP, intraperitoneal sensitization, and intravenous challenge. Uh, I would say that we see a parallel in uh, autopsy tissue from individuals that died of schistosomiasis pulmonary arterial hypertension in Brazil. So we also see evidence of um, an increase in IL-4 and IL-13, too. Um, we uh, uh, then used mice that were uh, deleted, whole body knockout, for IL-4 and IL-13, and showed that the absence of both IL-4 and IL-13 was protective against the immune-triggered um, pulmonary vascular disease. Deletion of IL-4 alone or IL-13 alone uh, did not really have protection. You really needed to uh, delete both of them. Um, so we do see an increase in the CD4 T cells uh, in the lung tissue of these mice uh, and by both immunostaining and flow cytometry. And then by looking at the uh, surface characteristics of the cells, so this is the uh, TCR V-beta um, uh, uh, the T cell receptor um, basically uh, uh, um, clonality, we can see that there's a, a shift in the, uh, in, the, in the distribution of the V-beta chain, indicating that there is clonal expansion of some of these um, uh, CD4 T cells, in particular in these uh, V-beta subsets here. And an area of ongoing work is, uh, in collaboration with Andrew Fontenot in the immunology group, is going to be trying to sort out what the um, T cell receptor repertoire is in these mice to try to identify the antigen potentially that's causing triggering of the pulmonary vascular disease. Um, so when we uh, then use mice that don't have T cells or B cells, these are RAG1 knockout mice. So RAG is the recombinase necessary to uh, uh, cause the T cell um, uh, um, uh, or the T cell receptor um, um, recombination event that occurs in the thymus. So when you don't have that um, gene, these mice cannot have developed T or B cells. And so they, interestingly, have a little bit of spontaneous pulmonary hypertension at baseline with the pressure a little bit higher. But uh, when you challenge them subsequently with the uh, schistosomiasis eggs, they do not develop uh, further pulmonary hypertension. And as you would probably expect, they have a lot less IL-4 and IL-13 because they um, can't mount that sort of proximate type 2 immune response. Uh, we subsequently have gone on to uh, reconstitute back in wild-type CD4 T cells into these RAG knockout mice, and so they can then redevelop some degree of pulmonary hypertension. And then when we reconstitute back in 
uh, CD4 T cells from IL4, IL13 doubly deficient mice, they then have suppression of the, of the um, pH phenotypes, indicating that it's really the, again, the type 2 or the Th2 uh, phenotype in those CD4 T cells that uh, drives the proximate immune response. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, Lysic C to um, a monocyte to TGF beta activation story. Um, this we actually published uh, about um, earlier this summer in uh, Nature Communications. So, um, this, uh, so basically in, uh, in mice that are exposed to, oops, just as mice, you see an increase in um, a key downstream signaling target of TGF beta signaling phosphorylated SMAD23 in the lung parenchyma and the vessels in particular of the mice that are exposed to schistosomiasis. And also we see the same thing in people that died again of the schistosomiasis pulmonary arterial hypertension in Brazil. Um, increased TGF beta signaling is also present in other forms of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, I mentioned that BMPR2 receptor uh, her underlying heritable form. When uh, uh, that's um, deleted out, then you potentially get sort of an unopposed canonical TGF beta signaling as one of the potential mechanisms. And also there's an increase in TGF beta signaling in other models of pulmonary hypertension. So uh, I would add in uh, patients with schistosomiasis pulmonary hypertension, there is an increase in TGF beta signaling. So this is from the A group in Brazil, which compared patients with hepatosplenic disease, that is that severe form of hepatic inflammation, to those that uh, without pulmonary hypertension, to those with hepatic disease and who develop pulmonary hypertension. The ones with pulmonary hypertension have higher levels of TGF beta in the serum, and there was some trend as well to higher levels of IL-13 as well. Uh, so um, we previously showed that uh, when you block the TGF beta signaling at multiple levels, you can um, prevent the uh, pulmonary hypertension phenotype. That was done through a pan TGF beta neutralizing antibody, 1D11, so it gets all three isoforms of TGF beta. Also a TGF beta receptor inhibitor, and then we used um, from uh, Xiaojing a, a, a SMAD3 deleted mouse and um, showed that all of those potential mechanisms can prevent the pulmonary hypertension phenotype. Um, uh, recently, uh, it was shown by the group uh, led by Dean Shepard at UCSF that mice that have a um, uh, genetic, uh, oops, a, uh, or a transgenic for a, a particular protein called FRA2, which causes, um, through not entirely clear mechanisms, fibrosis and downregulation of BMPR2, also have activation of TGF beta. And in this particular model, they um, deleted out the TGF beta receptor out of uh, smooth muscle actin CRE mice, uh, I'm sorry, out of smooth muscle actin um, uh, positive cells, so the, and, uh, the medial cells, the smooth muscle cells, and showed that these mice had less pulmonary vascular resistance and less pulmonary vascular, I'm sorry, less pulmonary vascular uh, thickening and less pulmonary vascular proliferation in mice with TGF beta blocked at the level of the, of the um, smooth muscle cell. And they also did the 1D11 experiment as well and showed protection. Um, so TGF beta is regulated at multiple levels, one of which is the uh, synthesis, but actually the synthesis isn't quite so important in the lung parenchyma. It turns out actually there's a lot of latent TGF beta that's stuck onto the various connective tissue in the lung. Um, and a more important potential uh, checkpoint of regulation is at the level of activation. And so TGF beta, when it's uh, initially synthesized, it's in this um, sort of um, nut-like uh, 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 configuration where you have the active ligand in the middle of what's called the latency-associated peptide, which surrounds it. That makes up the small latency complex, and then when it binds to latent TGF beta binding protein, that becomes the large latency complex. And so you really need to uh, somehow open up that, uh, that small latency complex to release the active ligand. There are multiple ways of doing that. Uh, in the, um, uh, in experimentally, you can heat it or um, irradiate it and whatnot. Uh, pH extremes um, in the in uh, um, in the in vivo, you can do it with serum proteases, integrins, and a, a compound or a protein called thrombospondin one, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, I would mention that in the lung fibrosis literature, it's probably more likely that alpha v beta six uh, integrin is probably more relevant, such as in uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So. Um, so a little bit of background on thrombospondin 1. So it's been previously shown that thrombospondin 1 null mice may have some degree of protection from hypoxia-induced pulmonary hypertension. We subsequently used these knockout mice and found it was confounded by high pressures at baseline in the, in the knockout mice, so that's not a great model. Um, in hypoxia, there's potentially this TSP1 is a very large protein and can signal via CD47 to activate nitroxide signaling. There's other potential mechanisms. And then uh, also um, one of the people in the pulmonary group here, James Maloney, showed 
in a particular family that uh, polymorphisms in the thrombospondin 1 gene can induce a form of familial pulmonary hypertension. So um, we started off by looking at the thrombospondin 1 levels at the RNA and protein levels in mice exposed to uh, schistomiasis and found that the levels oops, went up. And then when we blocked the proximate uh, type 2 immune response with the IL-413 double knockout mice, we suppressed the increase in thrombospondin 1. Uh, importantly, when we subsequently block the downstream signaling, so when we do TSP1 blockade or knockout, we do not see a, a shift in IL-4, IL-13. So it seems to be a downstream signaling target and not proximate to the type 2 response. Um, so the way that um, thrombospondin 1 can activate TGF-beta is by a, it's really kind of not so much enzymatic as it is a mechanical interaction. And so on the latency-associated peptide, there's a 4-amino acid uh, uh, sequence, LSKL, that interacts with a 4-amino acid sequence on the thrombospondin 1, KRFK. And when that interaction occurs, then the, uh, there's a change in the conformation of the uh, latency-associated peptide, which causes a, a, a shift, and then the, this, uh, the uh, active ligand of TGF-beta is released. And so basically, in the, in the, to block this, you can administer uh, synthetic LSKL, and it's a competitive inhibitor for the um, KRFK function of thrombospondin 1. And so um, we did that initially. I, this is data that we uh, used from uh, lung lysates of the mice. And so here we um, took the lung lysates, diluted it out a lot, and then treated cells that had a um, TGF-beta reporter. This is from uh, Dan Rifkin at NYU. And so these are cells, or these are um, mink lung epithelial cells that are uh, transfected with a PI-1 promoter. The PI-1 is a classic uh, canonical target of TGF-beta signaling, coupled to a luciferase reporter. And so you can read out the luciferase uh, activity as a, as a measure of active TGF-beta present in the lysates. And so we saw that upon exposure to our model, the IPIV eggs, there was an increase in active TGF-beta. And then when we administer this compound, LSKL, we suppress the active TGF-beta. Uh, and when we administer it to the mice, they develop protection, or they have protection from pulmonary uh, hypertension, uh, as uh, shown here by the right ventricular systolic pressure, as well as the uh, vascular remodeling characteristics. Um, so as far as the location of the thrombospondin 1, so I sort of already told you that we think it's coming out of the uh, Lysixe positive monocytes. And so we performed flow cytometry looking at intracellular thrombospondin 1 expression and identified as compared to unexposed mice. In exposed mice, we see the presence of two populations uh, that are of all thrombospondin 1 positive cells. Uh, and these are um, interstitial macrophages and intravascular monocytes. These are the Lysixe monocytes, and then we think that they basically become the interstitial macrophages as they migrate into the adventitia from the circulation system. Uh, and when we sort out the cells, they contain thrombospondin 1 by mRNA. Uh, we see these cells by immunostating. This didn't come out that great here, but we do see an increase in the number of cells around the adventitia of, of mice exposed to schistosomiasis. Um, and when we administer, so uh, these uh, cells, these Lysixe positive monocytes are bone marrow derived. And so when we performed a bone marrow knockout experiment, so we transplanted in knockout bone marrow oops, from um, thrombospondin 1 knockout mice, and uh, we see a protection in the, um, against the pulmonary hypertension phenotype when the thrombospondin 1 bone marrow is null. I mentioned before that the thrombospondin 1 knockout mice have some degree of pulmonary hypertension at baseline, probably due to a, um, a developmental defect, and so we avoid the phenotype of that by doing the bone marrow transplant. Um, and so you can uh, sort of restore the pulmonary hypertension phenotype in these mice by giving exogenous KRFK. So that's that 4 amino acid sequence that uh, has the TGF-beta activating function. And so when we take the mice oops, with the uh, thrombospondin 1 knockout and we, uh, in the bone marrow, and then we administer synthetic KRFK, they get a little bit of pulmonary hypertension back. Not nearly to the same degree as the wild-type overall mice, probably due to the distribution of and the dosing of the KRFK compound. Um, as far as the, uh, why those cells are recruited in, so we think a key cell that's doing that is the activated interstitial macrophage. So these are um, uh, cells that are probably activated by the type 2 immune response that then become alternatively activated, and they secrete various factors. We um, did a, a RNA-seq of sorted cells and identified several um, uh, proteins that cause homing of Lysixe positive monocytes. They include uh, the uh, ligand CCL2, 7, and 12 particularly in the, uh, in the interstitial macrophage population, not so much in the alveolar macrophages. And then when we block the recruitment of monocytes, so we use a CCR2 null mouse. CCR2 is the receptor on Lysixe positive monocytes required for their recruitment into the parenchyma. When we block those, um, that recruitment event by CCR2 null bone marrow, we uh, prevent the pulmonary hypertension phenotype. 
Um, so that was the schistosomiasis. I'm just going to briefly kind of mention a little bit of data about uh, another form of pulmonary hypertension, hypoxia-induced pulmonary hypertension. This one's more commonly used in the, in the literature. Uh, we're really kind of the only group currently that does schistosomiasis, uh, actually anywhere in the world. The one in the UK uh, kind of stopped doing it a year or two ago. So uh, in hypoxia, they also, or we also see an increase in uh, thrombospotted one uh, mRNA, both at the RNA and protein level. And then uh, when we block thrombospondin 1, either by administering that synthetic compound, LSKL, or null bone marrow, uh, we see a suppression of the pH phenotype, which uh, so is associated with a decrease in active TGF beta. And uh, in another model of pulmonary hypertension from uh, group uh, Kurt Stenmark CVP lab, uh, this is a model of neonatal hypoxic pulmonary hypertension. So these are newborn calves that are uh, taken into a hypoxia chamber. Uh, a hypobaric hypoxia, uh, so they're taken up to the equivalent of, I think, 18,000 feet or so um, pressure. And uh, basically, they have an increase, significant increase in pulmonary hypertension by that acute exposure in these newborn calves, and they also have an increase in uh, thrombospondin 1 in the uh, lung tissue. And then in another model of hypoxic pulmonary hypertension in the calves, also from Kurt Stenmark's group, uh, these are uh, adolescents now that are naturally at higher elevation. Uh, and they can develop a form of pulmonary hypertension called brisket disease, where the, uh, the neck region of the cow develops edema. It's sort of similar to actually right heart failure in people. And in the, this naturally occurring form of pulmonary hypertension, we see an increase in thrombospondin 1 as well in the, in the cows that go on to develop this uh, form of pH. And we, um, through uh, Todd Bowles' group, um, so Todd Bowles, one of the pulmonary hypertension clinicians here, he had banked uh, uh, serum from, or plasma from patients that... Um, had scleroderma, but did not have pulmonary hypertension. And then uh, some of them subsequently went on to develop pulmonary hypertension, and then he redrew the plasma on those patients. And we found that there was an increase in the thrombospondin 1 level uh, patients that, uh, with scleroderma that subsequently went on to develop pulmonary hypertension. So we think that this may apply to uh, other forms of human pulmonary hypertension other than schistosomiasis. And... Um, Confirming this or, um, you know, supporting this concept, this is a group, um, totally different group, that published um, around the same time that our paper came out, a small case series of patients with pulmonary hypertension due to other causes. This is uh, who group one pulmonary arterial hypertension, no scleroderma, or no schistosomiasis in here. Left heart disease and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, that's another form. They all had higher levels of thrombospondin 1, and furthermore, the level of thrombospondin 1 correlated with outcome or survival um, after diagnosis. So with that, I'll uh, conclude. So um, overall, we think schistosomiasis is a major cause of pulmonary hypertension worldwide. Um, it has a similar histopathology in response to treatment as other forms of uh, WHO group 1 or uh, classic forms of pulmonary arterial hypertension. The pathogenesis is mediated by TH2 inflammation, which results in TGF beta activation. And uh, thrombospondin 1 in particular, the TGF beta activating protein, may be a feature that's common to other forms of pulmonary hypertension. So with that, I'll conclude. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any questions. Steve. So, uh, nice talk. Thank you. Question, yeah, so the TGF beta inhibitor has been, you know, kicked around for treating cancer very effectively. Uh, have they gotten any better traction in the pulmonary hypertension? Um, not significantly. I think part of it is that, um, and, you know, also in lung fibrosis would be another classic place that uh, the TGF beta inhibitors are looked at. The issue with TGF beta direct inhibition is TGF beta is kind of ubiquitous. And so I think that there's probably uh, dose limiting side effects associated with, um, with the use of that particular, just sort of a broad, like the 1D11 compound, for example, in, in people. Um, so. Yeah, there's, I, mean, I think a ton of companies are developing this target just because it would be so attractive <laughs> in multiple diseases. Um, I think that that's probably not uh, great. And there ha I haven't seen use of the broad inhibitors in pulmonary hypertension. There have been, um, there is another compound. So I mentioned the BMPR2, uh, which has sort of a um, mutually antagonistic with a canonical TGF beta signaling pathway. And there is this group in the UK, again, Nick Morell's group. They had a um, I think Nature Medicine paper about a year ago where they looked at BMP9 as an agonist of BMPR2 and showed in uh, animal models that BMP9 can promote um, BMPR2 signaling and potentially have a counteracting effect. And I believe that there's a company in the works, I don't know what the state of things are that's looking at that. We think that, um, you know, being a little more selective about targeting TGF-beta, such as at the level of activation by maybe going after thrombospondin 1, 
would be a little bit more attractive than sort of broadly shooting for all forms of uh, TGF beta. So, yes. What's the what's the exactly antigen you mean? Yeah, what actually actually you will examine a substance from the air and then shoot a bit slower. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good question. So actually that's a um, that's like an aim of my R01 <laughs> is to try to answer that question. The eggs, so the eggs that we inject, they're live eggs. They are viable. If you took them out and put them in fresh water, they can infect a snail. They are secreting a ton of uh, proteases and other um, things because they, again, their, their, their goal in life is to digest through the wall of the colonic mucosa and re-enter the, the lumen. So they are extremely active. They're metabolically active. They're secreting a ton of things. In, um, in the uh, parasitology, immunology literature, there, uh, people have looked at this as far as the uh, <laughs> compounds that are secreted by the eggs that are sufficient to induce a Th2 immune response. And there's a particular glycoprotein called omega-1, which is secreted by the eggs. It has, um, I think, protease-type function, although I don't remember exactly. But that's the, that in the immunology literature, that is the particular protein that's secreted by the egg that is sufficient to induce a Th2 immune response. I'm not sure if that's going to be exactly the same thing in our lungs, but that would be sort of the candidate protein. It could. So yeah. So as far as the yeah. So as far as the interaction with um, TSP1 and stuff like that. So actually, the eggs themselves secrete compounds because the egg again, it's uh, part of it. Is it wants to avoid, evade the immune system. It's actually interested in trying to activate TGF beta in part to do so. And so some of the proteins actually secreted by the eggs have thromosponin one like motifs. If you kind of study the the basic uh, literature there, and so it's possible that they could also be independently activating TGF beta or uh, contributing to thromosponin one. You know. Activation and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Kevin Dean for Rheumatology. Thanks. Yeah. Great talk. Thanks very much. Is the, is, the, is the pathology the same across all these models of, of lung disease, like the, the hypoxic canal model versus other ones? In, in following that, do you have to have lung generation of TSP or TGF to, to generate this or to systemic inflammation or other processes? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, as far as the models, so I would say that in the humans, the pathology is the same across all forms of uh, WHO group one, that is pulmonary arterial hypertension. Chronic hypoxia falls under, in people, WHO group three. So it's actually a form of um, chronic hypoxia-induced pulmonary hypertension and not like inflammation and whatnot triggered. We think there's still you know, definitely inflammatory characteristics of it, but the pathology, you don't, for example, in a people get the plexiform lesions that you get in patients with scleroderma pH that you do in somebody that lives in Bolivia and is chronically exposed to high altitude. Uh, so similarly, the cattle, um, I don't believe they develop plexiform lesions. Kurt, I think, already stepped out. But I don't believe that the, the, the cows develop, um, for example, plexiform lesions. We don't really get that in the mice either. They do get pretty robust thickening of the pulmonary vasculature, particularly that neonatal model. They get really kind of dramatic pulmonary vascular disease. And I think it's a two-week time point. Um, so the pathology in the animals looks quite similar to that in the mice, neither of which is really highly representative of the human, which results, again, after sort of a long period of time of inflammation and stuff like that. And the other question you asked was TGF beta circulating versus local. So um, I think it's probably having to do with local. And the reason is because the, the, um, in, the sclera, sorry, in the schistosomiasis, you really need um, shunting of eggs into the lungs in people with schistosomiasis in order to develop the pulmonary hypertension. Just having a really bad liver disease and a lot of TGF-8 activation in the liver is, does not appear to be sufficient, probably. This is not true, clear, very clearly worked out, but probably is not sufficient to cause you to get pulmonary hypertension. You really need egg delivery into the lung and then the localized immune system in the lung to cause you to get pulmonary hypertension. And so I think that by just kind of generalized TGF beta, like the TGF beta in the blood, is probably not adequate. And I think part of it has to do with the adventitial localization of those TSB1 positive cells, where they're really activating TGF beta right in the vicinity of the vessels. Okay, thanks very much. Other questions? Okay. Thank you all very much for coming.